good morning, Jess. Good morning. It is an honor and privilege, first off, to just know you. Mm. And um, I'm so thankful for the way that God has uh, intersected our lives, and that has a little bit of a story to it. Yes. And as the director of Alternatives Pregnancy Center, I wanted to just kind of talk with you about your life, <laughs> about how God has walked with you through really difficult seasons, even though you didn't know Him, mm -hmm. and has pursued you, even though you made decisions that were um, later, you realize not the decisions that you probably should have made. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just want to really introduce the listening audience to your whole story that is very culturally relevant to us. And then how can the church respond um, in situations like yours? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Oh, this is going to be exciting. Yes. It, it, it's definitely a beautiful, glorious story. It, it, it literally all goes to God. It is. So I just want to open and kind of share with yeah. everyone how you and I got connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was asked to speak at your church mm -hmm. um, for a brief three minutes. <laughs> and I have to be honest, I was driving to uh, your church that Sunday morning and to give up a Sunday to talk for three minutes about the ministry of alternatives is kind of a sacrifice for me because what do you say in three minutes about yeah. the Ministry of Alternatives? So when I got there, I, I was a little frustrated um, that I was giving up a whole Sunday at my church with my husband and, and our family, um, church family. But as I was driving there, I literally said, God, you have a plan. Come on. You want me here. Mm -hmm. So do exceedingly and abundantly above what I could dream or imagine. Yeah. And God totally did that. Aww. So as I got there, I pulled in, um, met your pastor, talked really briefly with them about the process of the service, yeah. uh, saw you in the opening prayer, um, and then uh, after first service, ran to the bathroom, came back, saw you were still sitting in the sanctuary by yourself in mm -hmm. the front row mm -hmm. in between services. And, um, and, you know, I had in the meet and greet time came over and purposefully introduced myself to yeah. you and had immediate, as a Christian woman, I will admit, I had immediate judgments. And um, I just want to say right out of the gate, I'm so sorry that I judged you. Um, and I'm so sorry for anyone who sees you and makes immediate judgments about you. It was so convicting to me after we met. Um, so then I walked in and I was like, I see uh, her in the front row and uh, she's got shoes on, cute sandals. So yeah. I'm going to talk about the sandals. Yeah. When in doubt, um, talk about the shoes, right? <laughs> yeah, it worked. It worked. It worked. <laughs> and, you know, I, I thought, okay, here is a man who's dressed as a woman. Yeah. And, and what do I say? And yeah. so I talked about the shoes, talked about how cold it was out. And then you grabbed me and you said, Heidi, can I talk to you about something? Yeah. And, um, and so why don't you just briefly share uh, what happened as you saw me up front yeah. and how that interaction, how and why you wanted to talk to yeah, me. Yeah, my perspective of that moment. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Uh, to set the foundation a little bit, right before that, going to church, I normally shave. And so I keep a ritual that I do for my Thursdays, which for my young adults, you know, I touch up. And for Sundays, the rest of the week, you know, my face will do so that I don't get ingrown hairs as I'm going through this process, right? So that Sunday, though, I really wanted to, but I felt it pressed on my heart not to. And it was because the Lord needed you to see me how I was. Had I shaved, you wouldn't have at the moment. You wouldn't have come up to me because I would have been like another woman. That, you know, sometimes women talk to women, sometimes women don't talk to women, mm -hmm. right? But I was particularly different. I caught your eye, and as you came and you spoke, you were talking about how you guys help women. You help women in all different stages of life with different scenarios of their, you know, pregnant, not testing, how you help women. And so I was just thinking, I really am at a stage in my life where I understand my identity, that the Lord created me woman. And I know that I've had past experiences at different clinics that we know of, um, and it just did not go well there. I was not because my ID said male, even though my body parts said female, they would not address, right? Because that's not what they do. They do not help males at other clinics. So, or um, yeah, other clinics. So when I saw you speaking, I was so like, wow, Lord, 
here is a free opportunity to check in and 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 walk and claim the identity of woman because i would go and i would i would look at myself i would have to analyze because the doctor's going to analyze so it's like jess you're here you're a woman and so when i saw you and you talked to me it was like oh perfect i'm the type of person i was going to go up to you anyways but i was going to go at the end so it worked out great that we got to speak but I, I asked you, would you help people like me? Mm-hmm. That was my question. Yeah. I have a particularly different walk. Mm-hmm. Would you help people, someone like me, because I haven't had help. Mm-hmm. I have not received free help. And the Lord knows my situation financially. He provides and he knows where I'm at. So he provided this company, this resource to me. The mm-hmm. three minutes you came changed my entire life. Mm-hmm. It changed everything. Yeah. So in that moment, um, you know, I made an assumption that you yeah. were a man who was yeah. dressing as a female. Mm-hmm. And um, when you grabbed my hands and said, uh, would you help a woman like me? And you said, Heidi, what you need to know about me mm-hmm. is that I'm actually biologically female. Yep. Um, I transitioned into a male, have been taking testosterone for the last six, six and year. a half years. Yep. Perfect. And I now find my identity in Jesus Christ. Name it, yep. And I want to care for my female body parts. And there's no one out there who has done that for me in the last six and a half years. And here you are, you're a free women's medical clinic. Yes, we're a clinic that primarily um, helps women in unplanned pregnancy situations. But our motto has always been, we are pro-gospel first, we are pro-woman second, and we are pro-life third. And we believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Uh, Every woman that God sends through our doors and sends to our ministry, we have a profound impact in her life and a profound influence in her life. And we pray as a team on a consistent basis that God would draw broken women to our clinic in need of medical services Mm -hmm. and we could love on them as a daughter of the King of Kings and provide the holistic care that a woman needs. And I never dreamed prior to that moment that God would use our ministry in a situation like this. And so in that moment, we both grabbed hands right after you told me that you had just prayed that morning that God would provide free women's medical services for you. And you were like, here you are. (laughs) Literally, literally, yes. And in that moment, we were crying, we were laughing, we were, um, you know, and my mind was running 100 miles an hour. And immediately I was thinking, number one, clinics like ours are not ready for this. Number two, God, for whatever reason, you have given us an OBGYN doctor who just happens to be a specialist in hormone therapy. Like, what are the odds? And, um, and then also embracing, as a pregnancy center, embracing this full OB model yeah. was something I didn't even realize how God was going to use that profoundly down mm-hmm. the road. And so we just kind of sat there in that moment and it was just, it felt like an incredibly beautiful gift from God. Yes, um, yes. That, that in that moment, I was deeply convicted Um, and I have to say that after we met the excitement and the joy, I got in my car and the first thing I did was I broke down in tears because I was so disappointed in the way that I judged you and in the way that I reacted immediately to you as you began to talk before I ever even knew your story. And I just had to confess that to the Lord. You know, God's word says in James that we are not to judge each other. And there's a whole reason why, because we have no idea where that person has been. We have no idea uh, the pain and the suffering that that person has gone through. And we have no idea how the Lord has relentlessly pursued those people and desires to use the Mm -hmm. church in the process. But the church is often the first place that brings judgment upon people like you. And as I got to know you more, the most beautiful part about your story is how different churches had come alongside you, different people had come alongside you and uh, helped you through that process because it wasn't instant. It was a process. So now let's just dive into your story a little bit. So from the beginning... Talk about um, 
talk to us about kind of where it all began and why and how. Absolutely. So when I was younger, I was about 15 years old and I had, you know, I wasn't close to my family. My dad was already, you know, passed away. And so I was making friends. My mom never let me hang out with boys. She only let me hang out with girls. And so with that, I started to have what some call best friends, right? I was getting close to these women and um, building friendships, right? You want love. You're not getting it from your, your family. You're not getting it from your siblings. And that's my situation. I was not receiving it from um, the way that I needed to receive it from my mom or my siblings taking care of them since I was 10 years old. You know, I relied on these friendships. When I was 15 years old, um, I liked this boy and his cousin came to a basketball game. And so I met her and we built a friendship. The next day she came over and she wanted to stay the night. And I was like, you know, I just met you. It might be fine. She uh, actually, when we were hanging out, she took my hand and stuck it in her pants. And we goes, this is what we do. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do this. And I pulled my hand out and I was like, I, I don't want to do this. And she's like, no, but this is what we do. You know, this is what friends do. And I was so confused because I hadn't had a friendship like that. And I don't know what best friends do because this, this, this is what I'm building, right? And so unfortunately, my mindset, you know, shifted to this is what friends do. Mm. So I unfortunately created a pattern of having a lot of best friends like that, where we, you know, explored each other because that's what friends do. And they're, you know, unfortunately creating a quote unquote safe space because we're friends, right? You're not doing this with somebody else. And so trying to confide in each other. I ended up going down this track of being with women. Uh, and that's 15 years old. That's not knowing anything. That This is me talking to my best friends. And then society around me at this time, it's 2008, 2009. And it's like, okay, you have to choose. You cannot be bisexual. At the time of the community, being 15 years old, um, about to go into, um, from eighth grade going into ninth grade, you had to choose. You either like boys or you like girls. You could not like both. And, and you said you remember distinctly the yes. conversation that you had explained that. Yes, yes, yes. So there was these, um, there were these kids that are like, you literally cannot like bo both. You have to choose one, boys or girls. And I remember thinking in my mind, I don't want to get pregnant. Like I haven't been with a boy. I don't want to have sex with a boy. But teen, that show Teen Mom was out. So it was around me, teen pregnancy. And I did not want to be a teen mom. And so I never even got with a boy. So I've never you know, explored men. And so I remember having this conversation and I was like, well, I've been with women. I, I'm going to just stay here. It's safe. And I don't got to go through figuring out sex and I don't got to go through having a kid. I wouldn't even know how to handle a kid. Mm -hmm. I've been taking care of my siblings since I was 10. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I'll just stay with women. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with this mindset, I'm now seeing patterns around me of hurt women. And it's not their fault. They're going through what they're going through. I'm not understanding at the time, but I'm just looking. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging what's around me. Mm -hmm. And it's broken women. Unplanned pregnancy is a real thing. When you're not careful to know why you're even having sex, why you're even connecting with a person, why you're even allowing that, like you're not going to understand unplanned pregnancy. You're going to blame other things. Mm -hmm. But why are you even at the point? Mm -hmm. And that's what God was showing me. I don't want to be at that point with men. Like, I, I want to be safe. I want to be in control. If I'm in control, nothing can happen to me. Mm -hmm. I can't get hurt again. Mm -hmm. You know, men can't hurt me. I can't, I won't have an unplanned pregnancy because I'm not even with men. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that's when the, the lies of the enemy are coming in, right? This is me needing to take control at 15 years old. This is me needing to decide my entire life right then and there. And unfortunately, being, you know, at that time, very prideful, I chose it. I made my decision. And at that time, I didn't want to be someone who was like everyone else who lied and changed their mind. And that's where my pride came in from the enemy of like, no, you said, you said you're going to be with women, be with women. Mm -hmm. Even if I got curious when I was in high school, later on, like senior year, I wouldn't even be able to look at boys because I was curious, but I couldn't look at them because I had made up my mind. Mm. And that pride stuck with me. Mm -hmm. I graduated high school at night, uh, 18. And then, so you, just to backtrack and yeah. reiterate, you know, for you, it really was, number one, you saw 
men hurting women. Yep. Um, number two, you want it to be a woman of your word. Yes. And then on top of it, in that situation, talk a little bit about like how you were raised as a tomboy. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and just what you felt like in your identity. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, the things around me that I was seeing for my identity, I was looking at TV shows. I was looking at other alternatives because what was in front of me wasn't what I wanted. So now I'm looking at uh, things around me. I'm, I'm more comfortable in boy clothes. I'm more comfortable hiding the physique that men are chasing, right? I'm a younger, uh, I was a young woman at the time. I was an athlete. I played basketball. So playing basketball, I always wore basketball shorts and a t-shirt. So it was always casual. Um, and then liking women, women liked boys. So I was a girl that looked like a boy. Why? Because that's what women liked. And that was also comfortable for, for me. So getting lost in identity, I'm making it all around about other things. I'm not even making it about me. I felt comfortable in the shorts, but I'm looking at things around me. My mom can't financially provide for girly clothes. At that time, it was very expensive to have, you know, chic things and be all you know, girly. It was easy to be in basketball shorts. I played basketball, so I needed those for practice and I could wear those. So now I'm making my comfortability about things around me. I'm not taking the time. To, what do I really want? I don't know how to analyze my own thoughts. I'm a teenager confused looking at things that make no sense, but I'm trying to make sense of these things rather than just come to myself. What do you want, Jess? Now in days, kids are so okay with saying what they want and they think that they know what they want. If they actually stopped and took the time, they would reanalyze. Ah, I actually don't want to do this anymore. But people don't know how to stop and change. Why? Because they made up their mind. Mm -hmm. We made up our mind. We have to do what we say. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be wrong. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be wrong. And, and then for you so have long, the, I didn't the, want to. the cultural pressures around you as well. Yes. You know, that are yes. re-emphasizing all of these behaviors in your life, right? Absolutely. So. And being in pride and going to those pride events and going into LGBT events, like you have to choose. Mm -hmm. You could not like at this time that in my age, you could not be bi. Being bisexual was you were confused. You didn't know what you wanted. You couldn't make up your mind. And again, that's pressures of people making you choose. Mm -hmm. If you stopped and you thought about it and made the adjustments, they wouldn't even people in the LGBT community, you're not even safe to change your mind. Mm -hmm. You're not even safe. I was a lesbian to transition to a trans male, right? I'm going by this identity now. I still was not accepted mm -hmm. in the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. I was still fighting for a space. And yet the you know? narrative is all about acceptance, right? right? Exactly. So it blows my was mind. was that confusing to you oh a little God. bit? More than ever. So transitioning from female, being a lesbian, you know, not being with men, it was okay, you know? So now I'm confused with this because I'm always wearing boy clothes. All right, it looked like a boy, but now I've always had long hair. And there was a time that I'm learning in school. So this is a whole nother subject for a whole nother time. But school's out there, you know, giving you information that's recent. Like it's just new information. It's not some study that's like, this is what's best for you. Some dude 10 years ago says, okay, here's a word that says you want to change your gender. Here you go. Here's transgender. Unfortunately, I grabbed that narrative. If you think you are a different gender, this is how you change it. Yeah, so it blew my mind mm. how easily that happened for you. So you talk about how oh my you visited the doctor yeah. and what, what led up to that appointment yeah. and, um, and then what happened? Yeah, so as I'm in this class and, and I'm learning about how to change your gender, it's when you think you're a different gender, your mind and your body don't align. So I think I'm a boy, so I want to make my, I want to dress like a boy. I want to make my, I want to turn into, you know, I feel like I was not made but that's a feeling. And I believe that goes later into the story when I tell you about my healing, but that's a feeling. Keep that thought. I felt like a boy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a feeling, mm -hmm. right? It's not real. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. So I so felt like a boy. So this was a class you were mm -hmm. in. So I took a sexual in... orientation class in college. Okay. And so I learned about the word and it's, if you're not aligned, how do I make myself aligned? Well, I'm confused. I didn't walk through my thoughts. So I just said, oh, that's the word. If I already dress like a boy and I kind of feel like a boy, I can just turn into a boy. I wasn't on the Internet at the time. Google had only been hot for you know, a couple of years. So I'm not thinking, you know, I didn't do my own research. I just heard this in a class. I grabbed it. I went to my doctor and I told them, you know, that I want to 
I want to start testosterone. I want to be a boy. Mm -hmm. And so it was that quick. And he goes, so you really believe that? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, you have to go through one therapy session. And I went through one and I told her, I was like, I think that I'm a boy. I dressed like one since I was a kid. You know, I've been comfortable like this. I, I think I want to cut my hair. And that quick, I was able to start testosterone in that one conversation because I told them what I felt. Wow. I did not go through some deep analyzation of why do you feel this way? What let what is are you right before you go and change your entire life and put this hormone and change everything about you? Why? Had I had a doctor that sat with me and really had me analyze my life, mm -hmm. I would have worked through why. Mm -hmm. Why I was confused. I wouldn't have spent six years on hormones trying to figure out why. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to say I was wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what leads me to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I broke down on testosterone. I did it. I felt so, quote unquote, happy doing all of what society says, right? Get the house. Get the car. Get the girl. I'm doing all these checkbox things because I think that that's what's right. Because I still can't say that I was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I keep going and going until I'm at the point where I try to take my life. At this time, I didn't grow up in a church. I'm now 23, 24. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. If you're real, I don't know what to do. Someone called the police. and They came up to my car. They took me to the hospital. I went to a mental hospital with a three-day stay because of attempt of suicide. And in that moment, I was just like, God, you're clearly real. Because I know what I took to die. I was sitting there waiting. And somehow a friend managed to know where I was. You know, I phone locations. You forget that you share with your friends. <laughs> and, you know, she, she, she felt something was off. And the Lord came to me while I'm in the mental hospital. Hey, I'm here for you. And that, that's it. I have it in a notebook. That will be in a book one day that he was there for me. Two months later, someone, uh, I got a new job and he led me in the salvation prayer. And I was like, that makes sense, right? I felt that there was someone who saved me and I'm talking to God like, okay, you're here. This guy leads me in this prayer and he invites me to church. So you're working with this guy. Talk yeah, about that yeah, relationship. Yeah, he's just a supervisor. Yeah, so talk about that relationship yeah, a I'm little only, bit. I'm only on a weekend. Uh -huh. I'm just a weekend. He pulls up a chair next to me and says, hey, did you know that you're loved? And I'm like, oh, oh this is like right now. We're going to do this right now. 3.30, right before we get out for work. Okay. And he goes, did you know that you're loved by God? And I was like, I think, like, I think I do know that though. Mm -hmm. And so when he said that, it was like, all right, I'm, I'm in this. Mm -hmm. But because remember, I'm, I'm so strong willed. Mm -hmm. If I make up my mind, so if I said, I said in that moment, I will, I believe you, I will follow you. Mm -hmm. And that was just the beginning. That was literally the beginning. That was February 9th, 2020. Wow. I said, yes, I'm still identifying as a man. Mm -hmm. I've been on testosterone at this point by, Four years, five years, I'm and on it. and the gentleman who was, doesn't know that has no idea. No, he thinks he's know. talking to a man. Yep, yeah, I have a whole it. beard at this time. Mm -hmm. I have short hair. I was cute. <laughs> I, was cute. I had surgery by this time, so like, uh -huh. I I was whole because I committed. I because mm -hmm. I did not want to say I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things that the Lord teaches me between February and May of 2020 is forgiveness mm -hmm. of myself forgiveness of myself and forgiveness of my past. Now, he's not telling me yet to change. He's not, he's not doing any of that. I'm going to this church that he invited me to, and I'm just figuring out that the Lord is real, mm -hmm. feeling his love, feeling that presence. I'm excited to go to church. So you have you a guy know? pull mm -hmm. up a chair next to you, yep. tell you that you're loved by God. Yep. You had a situation prior to that that kind of led you in that direction, which is so God in pursuit of his people yes. in the middle of the mess. Yep. And then he invites you to church yes. and you're going as a man. Yep. Um, and I don't know if our listening audience caught this, but I want to go back really quick and reiterate yeah. something. You didn't just start taking testosterone. 
you had surgical procedures done. Yes. Can you just yes. really quickly, before we go into your gospel-centered um, yeah. uh, uh, testimony, testimony mm -hmm. talk about what led you to surgery? Yeah, it, as, as I've been committed into this, it's all over social media that everyone's comparing. And I'm, I have now, I've been in this three years, I'm committed. And I'm like, you know what, it's, it's time. There's these things that uh, trans folk, we wore, it's called binders. That's to put a compression on your chest. So now you're pressing, like putting a lot of pressure on your chest. I'm now making them flat and I'm now hurting myself, right? And it was just so painful. There's even tape and it would be ripping off your skin. It was just so painful. And I didn't want to go through that anymore. And I was like, you know, I'm going to get this surgery. I'm going to do this and, and remove this. And I'm going to feel a lot more happier in my body. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think I even... So you're fully... talking about your breasts. Let's yes. Just be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wanted Top your surgery. breasts to go away. Yes. Yeah. I, I wanted to take care of that. And I was just like, there was so much pressure physically on me that like with my breathing changing, I'm like, this just makes sense mm -hmm. because I don't, I'm not looking at myself anymore. I've now lost myself in my clothes. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at my body anymore. And so when I look at it, I'm like, I, I don't like it. But why? In reality, I spent so much time hiding with what I wore. I never took the time to analyze what it was doing to me, mm -hmm. what I was, what I was actually doing to my body. I would never stopped and thought about it. If I'm being completely honest, there's so much go, 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 go in my life. I make up to say, go, go. Okay, you mm -hmm. said today I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to meet with you. That meeting led to this. That led to that. That led to that. That's what happened. This class led to that phrase, led to me thinking Well, let's it. just start yeah. back. Like the, the situation where the girl yeah. put your hand, yes. it's just down her Literally, pants. Literally, go, went, go, yeah. go. Girlfriend, girlfriend, yeah. girlfriend. Yeah. Another, yeah. another girl, another girl. Next hand, like. It was ridiculous mm -hmm. until the Lord. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this confusion with surgery. And then I schedule for hysterectomy. I took care of this. I was like, all right, mm -hmm. whew, we're healing. We're good. Let's go to the next step. And the next step would be a hysterectomy to prepare you for either uh, a metoidioplasty or a phalloplasty, which is an attachment that they take off of your forearm to create a penis. So you have to go through this step to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. If my goal's really that, and I had been freaked out, my, I, I, I felt so confident in that area, I did not want the phalloplasty. So I was like, okay, God, but why, like, so if I don't, if I know I don't want that, why am I going to do a hysterectomy? And so I would battle, mm. I'd battle. I had scheduled three hysterectomies. Mm. And how easy was it? Oh, for so you, easy. And easy for you yeah. to remove your breasts. Like, it yep. was just like It that. was just, I, I, I called them. Um, you have to just be under 250 pounds and they'll do the surgery. So I just met with this guy um, and then he, um, he was actually in the bay and then he was going to be gone. So um, he rescheduled. This little doctor just moved up from um, UCLA to got, work with Kaiser, ended up in SAC. She only did five surgeries. I was her first trans male surgery. Wow. She was here for five surgeries and then left. And I was like, you know, at the time I'm thinking, wow, this is such a blessing that I got to take it. Right. And I'm not thinking of God. I'm just thinking this is good. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, I got this taken care of finally. Right. Right. You're thinking worldly. Blessing. Yes, worldly. <laughs> exactly. I was like, hold on. Let me let me make sure I clarify because I was not of the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, in reality when I think about things. But God does allow us to walk through our walk. Mm -hmm. God does, at the, you know, as I get to the spiritual God gives part, us free will. There, at the end of the day, yep. each decision, he's right there, though. He made sure I was healed, though. He took care of me, though. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He made sure I wasn't in pain. I didn't have I don't have tremendous scars, mm -hmm. but they left it in such a way that I was supposed to make, quote unquote, pecs. Mm. Now that I'm in my journey, it's making and shaping my body the way that God is intended. Mm. It's so beautiful because normally they cut off all parts of the skin and it's super like flat, almost to like, you know what I mean? They left a little bit so that I could make a peck. Mm. Little did the lady know the blessing that it, it, it was for me in reality that I don't have to go to get another surgery. Mm. So at that time, I scheduled those hysterectomies, right? I was just like, all right, I'm ready to do this. I flaked on that one. Okay, when do you need to reschedule? They just called me back. Mm -hmm. I rescheduled. And I just could not. The day it would come, I just, I just, so I can't, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So by the grace of God, here I am today that I have full capability and I did not get that hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. I am able to, to bear children, which is a different part of the testimony later because mm -hmm. this clinic plays a part in that. But um, I was able to cancel those. I did not go to those. And as I continue in this journey, I'm still confused. 
I'm still with women, getting lost in work, and I'm now in my day-to-day life. Had the surgeries, flaked on those doctor's appointments, rescheduled those doctor's appointments, kept getting with women, getting with women, and then I just had to stop. Mm-hmm. Okay, so take us back to when yeah. you started going to church. Yep, that's why I had to stop. Yeah. And what, and what kind of I said led I had that, to stop. that yeah, conviction? Yeah, I was so much dating. I'm going, I'm, I met with this doc, the, the, the coworker that led me in the salvation prayer. He was a pastor before. Mm. So he wasn't actively working as a pastor, but that calling's on your life, right? right. That, that doesn't matter to spread the gospel. And he spread it with me. And then he took me on kind of like as his little protege. He was teaching me scripture at work now. So it, it, be, it was a very fun environment as, you know, to be with the Lord and take care of work. That's God, right? Mm-hmm. So he would take care of, God would take care of my clients and whatever, because I was a care manager. He'd take care of everything I needed so I could listen to the gospel by this guy. Mm-hmm. So my shifts were taken care of and I would be able to get another piece of the word, get another message, get a new lesson. And God was moving so quick. Yeah. So as he's teaching me forgiveness, I'm surrendering. I'm giving this to the Lord slowly. When he led me in this salvation prayer, I had not been talking to my family for two years, two and a half years, because I was so deep in this sin and, and so deep in as at the time I was identified as Aiden. So I was so deep in this that I would not be around anyone who did not accept that, mm-hmm. even my family. Yeah even friends, Mm -hmm. like I cut off every single person and took a whole new identity. I said, I no longer want to be attached to all. It was too much. Mm -hmm. It was literally too much of being with women, being a girl, being going through all that I couldn't change. I was like, I already committed too much. But instead of changing and just stopping there, I had to go deeper. Mm -hmm. I had to keep running further, so much more deep into this. Why? Because they have tools and resources. You want to keep going further? You can keep going further. Mm You know, and which I'm, is so like Satan, right? Oh, like it is. one, if you think about one it, decision yes. leads to another, which mm-hmm. leads to another. So Jess, obviously in our culture and in our day and age, this is running rampant. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that there are a lot of scared parents out there yeah. that um, are not only concerned for their kids and what they're learning in school. Mm-hmm. Um, and now basically our culture says teachers are responsible now for stepping in and making decisions yeah. f- for parents. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if you were a parent um, with a child who is confused, what advice would you have for them? I think the first approach would be to have conversations, open conversations with your child. You need to show them that you care and that you actually want to hear what they're saying. God knows your heart posture. So before you go to those conversations, please pray. Take it to God that he gives you the words that reaches them where they're at. But have that conversation. What are you feeling? No, 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 no. I hear you. You think you're a boy. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Why do you think you're a boy? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're not a boy. Mm -hmm. I'm not invalidating your feelings. I hear you. But why are you thinking that way? Mm -hmm. What is making you feel this way? If those questions are analyzed, they can look at it. Is it because, and then they can address it. Tommy said this and that, so I must be. And you can, well, that's a lie. So we can go to the root and get it while they're young. If you just, if they just keep, well, because I feel, because I feel. Okay, I heard you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you feel. I got you. Same page. Mm -hmm. What led to that? Who said something? Because there's a root to everything. Mm -hmm. In my situation, I felt this way because I did not want to say I did not want to be with girls. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was I was in eighth grade. I'm now in high school. I don't want to do this anymore. But I could not say that. I did not know how to use those words. Mm -hmm. If a safe space is provided, you can have conversation. Mm -hmm. Sit with them. Don't yell. Don't have an approach that's to attack. Mm -hmm. You want to figure out. You want to get to the root as to why they're that way. You have to be reasonable with Mm -hmm. them. You don't have to go and push your opinions, your views, or get anxious or angry, but you have to be vulnerable. If you're wanting your child to be vulnerable with you, you've got to be vulnerable with them. Let them know you're curious as to why they're thinking that way. Yeah, and I want to be clear too, part of your story is their sexual abuse. Yes. Probably pornography. Yeah. Um, Obviously, a lot of children are not going to go there. Yeah. If that's happened to them. Um, and that is leading them to situations that like you led you from one thing to the next. 
Is there a way that you would have felt safe in sharing those things with your mom? Or was that just like that there was no going there? Well, for myself, it was a matter of I never had my unfortunately with my situation, my mom did not know communication. That's my love language words. Mm -hmm. If we talk, I can I can you, you get that physical doesn't work for me. So if I had a safe space where I, my mom came to me, mm -hmm. coming to, coming, if I came to my parent, hey, I need to tell you I got hurt, that's hard. I'm now trying to go past like what I can physically even handle, mentally, even emotionally say to my mom. And then I've got to tell her I got hurt. I got to tell her who it was that hurt me. That's so much on a child. Mm -hmm. If the parent, have you been this way? Have you been touched? Have you been hurt? Have boundaries been crossed by anybody that you know? I'm coming to you because these are real things to consider. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to sit here and say, you got hurt that that's why you're this way. But that's what leads to some of the confusion and the, the, the thinking that's with this generation. There's no communication because we think that we're right. But I think if the parental figure comes to the child and provides the safe space, we're so much, why does the kid need to do it for the parent? You know, I come from a generation that that's what we did. Our parents couldn't do things, so we took initiative. As a parent right now, you need to take initiative. You need to get that role back in your household and take dominion over your house again and that authority because God give, has given you that. So to do that, we have to, as parents, I'm not a parent, but as a parent, you would have to take that and create that safe space. Mm -hmm. Why put that on the child to come to you and tell you when they got hurt? And it's, you may not even know if your child has been hurt. But creating that safe space to ask the questions, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I know we're trying to figure some things out. I want to be real with you and I want you to be real with me. I cannot love you all the way. I cannot help you all the way if I don't know all the details because the details matter as we know, mm -hmm. right? The little things matter. And so those little things not talking about that, that hurt, they're now going to have to, as adults, work through their sexuality and then go to therapy and then figure out why they made their decisions. If they get to talk to their parent, because the parent created the safe space, because the parent took the authority back in the home and, and wants to do that, though. That, the, the will has to be on the parent. They can't just, well, why are you this way? Why'd you do it? Mm -hmm. who, who, who did it now? Mm -hmm. Come on, are you kidding me? You know who you are. No, 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 no. It's that heart. There's not enough love in the world right now. There's so much pain and hurt that parents are going through that they haven't healed from. And that's a whole nother conversation for yeah, a whole nother for day. Sure. But in, sure. in general... It's that parent that should create that safe space mm -hmm. because they already have to be vulnerable with what they're about to share, coming to them and just talking to them. Mm -hmm. Did something happen? Mm -hmm. I know it's hard to talk about, but did it happen? And showing them that you love them through it, that you're not going to go and try to take care of it or go mm -hmm. hurt the person or get the police involved. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just need your parent to just show you love and just be there mm -hmm. and listen because we're turning to best friends or you know people that we shouldn't be turning to. And trusting in other people, that leads us down a whole path because we can't just trust our parent mm -hmm. because we just can't talk to our parent. It's so true. It's how the enemy destroys the family mm -hmm. um, and destroys the relationships within a family. Everything else goes, yeah. you know? And so, okay, um, jumping back into your story, one of my uh, most favorite things about your story is the sanctification process mm. that happened with you. Yes. And I think it's really important for everyone that's listening to this to understand as believers in Jesus Christ, we often want people that we're witnessing to, to just make a decision and then everything should just change from that moment mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And that is not reality in any yeah. of our lives. Exactly. Like it is a process that God has taken us through and is taking you through. And so from the moment you accepted Christ, still living as a man, yeah. the first thing that God did for you was show you forgiveness, yes. forgiveness of yourself, yes. um, forgiveness of what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And yet you were still living as a man. Yep. And then you met a woman and you were going to a church and yeah. you were looking at getting married. Yes. So start yes. there. Yes. So at this point, I'm thinking, okay, well, if God found me as a trans man, he must, like, he must like, not care that I am this way. And so in the beginning of this process, I was believing you know, that the Lord had accepted me as I was, because he did. At the end of the day, he did accept me as I was, and that's why I came to him. But certain words I received in that time, um, later on I learned the word may not be for the timing. <laughs> the, the word is the word, but it may not be for that timing. So an example is I, heard, I felt from the Lord to be a pastor, right? A leader. 
And I'm thinking, okay, I'm grabbing this. I'm new in faith. The Lord must be saying as a trans pastor. So as I'm going through this, I'm getting committed. I'm following the Lord. I'm looking at Bible schools. I have found a partner that is following the Lord as well. And I'm still not seeing the the sin in being transgender yet. I'm still just experiencing his love, experiencing who he is, learning the word of God. So I'm still in the new beginning of this process. But as I continue to get deeper, I just have this feeling there's no way that God would be telling me that I got to go be a girl. There's no way. I'm still talking to this girl. I'm like, there's no way that God has that for me later. There's no way that he'd want that. And I'm still with this girl. And I'm, and, and I'm battling with this. We're a week. We're supposed to get married on Friday. It's Monday of that same week. And you met at church, Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to church together. Um, uh, you were baptized North together. Yes, we were baptized together. Everything. So we're really feeling this is from the Lord. The entire church doesn't know that I'm trans, but they're backing it. They're paying for our, they're paying for all the whole venue. They paid for our photography. Like we had this ready and something in me was just like, you cannot marry her. You cannot marry her. So I call it off on Monday for that Friday that I, I can't do this. Something I just, I cannot do this with you. Here we are two years, three years later, and I see why it w- didn't work out, but it was in that moment of like, you know what? I need to stop dating. It was at the end of that. And this is the beautiful part of that sanctification. So this is in 2021. COVID had just been happening, right? We're all isolated. So I'm like, all right, God, is me and you now. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm not dating anymore. So I'm still single with that, right? So I'm not dating. All right, God, show me all of it. He started showing me his love. He started showing me his presence, his kindness through my family starting to restore the, my relationship with my mother. And in this time, he's, he's pressing on my heart that, that I am his child. And it says that we are his child. It's not saying a gender. It's I'm his child. So I'm now getting pressed on my heart. God, I'm not with her. It had already been on my heart. Are you telling me that I might gotta, I, I might gotta go back? And I was wrestling. Like, I would tell that same girl she was my friend. I'm like, I would kill myself. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. There's no way. If God's telling me that, there's no way. But that's not what he was telling me in the moment. And that's what he kept telling me. I'm not telling you that right now. Mm-hmm. I keep thinking, are you, God, are you going to tell me? Are you going to tell me? And I, that's not what he's telling me. Mm-hmm. And just for clarity's yeah. sake, you're saying he's not telling you he wants you to be a girl. Exactly. He's not telling yeah. me that. He's, he loves me where I'm at. Mm-hmm. And as I finally accept it, he's loving me as I'm at. I get to continue to go to church, continue to get in the word, and I'm learning everything else. In a worship service, I just start to surrender. And I felt the unction on, from the Lord. And I put my hands out and say, it's yours. I, I give it to you. And when I did, I knew, I literally knew. And I just started crying. And the next day was supposed to be my shot day because I'm still on testosterone this whole time. Mm-hmm. About to get married. I'm committed. And oh, after that, You're calling up the wedding. Yes. Worship service. Yeah. Right? And I just felt the surrender. And the next day was shot day and I never did it again. Wow. Hey, he's still sanctifying me. Of course, this is, this is not ended, but this was the beginning. Mm-hmm. I've now been off of testosterone one year and four months. So glory to God for that. But it was that moment that changed everything because he was working on me that entire time, Mm -hmm. showing me love, that I was in a safe space, that there's people around me that care about me. Because why? He cares about the foundation. Mm -hmm. If I'm about to stop this testosterone that he has for me down a year later, which it was a year after that, it was what? I needed a good foundation. Mm -hmm. I needed support. God doesn't do anything and not set you up. Mm -hmm. He's a God who provides. So, of course, he'd set up everything around me, Mm. a safe space, safe job, safe family. So there's this Christian cliche out there that I want to be really clear is not true. And the Christian cliche is God loves us right where we're at, but doesn't expect us to change, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, yes, and in your situation, God loved you right where you're at. And it is vitally important as believers in Jesus Christ, we come alongside of people. We love them right where they're at. Exactly. But God does not want us to stay there. The power of the cross and the death of Jesus Christ to redeem yep. people from sin yep. is a transformational process mm-hmm. that is, as you just described, the letting go and the surrendering yep. of that sinful life mm-hmm. and walking 
uh, denying yourself, taking up your cross yeah. and following Christ. And for yeah. you, embracing a, a being a woman, being, as I said at the tea event, yeah. a daughter of the King yes. of Kings yes. and Lord of yes. Lords, yes. That, what, that is part of your sanctification journey. Mm -hmm. It is part of allowing Jesus to love you right where, they're, right where you're at, teach you truth as you stayed in God's word yep. and then continuing that transforming power. Yeah. So yeah. I just, I want our listening audience to really understand that. And that is what's so beautiful about mm. your story is it just didn't happen overnight for you. Yeah. It was a process and you were, you were dead set about staying in God's word, staying in community, allowing truth to be spoken to you. Yeah. So let's go there now. So, yeah. um, you, 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 you left that church. Yep. You came to a new church. Yes. They knew you as Aiden, yep. still as a still as a a man. Yep. You had been baptized. You had accepted Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now now what? Yeah. So I left that church when you know when the when I called off the wedding shortly after. It was just like you know she still goes there and it just got sticky. You know I don't want to mess up her walk with God and I just didn't go. I had a caregiver come to that company that I was still working at with that pastor. Um and so. He still goes to that church and I went to, you know, I stopped going there and this caregiver came in and I, she had never worked with us before. She wanted to do an application, said, sat down doing the application, heard the worship song on and goes, have you ever heard of Thrive Church? I was like, no. She goes, I think you'd really like it. If you like this kind of music, they do that kind of worship. I was like, oh, no way. Okay. And I went and she told me about this um, prayer group on Friday nights. It was literally the next night. And I was like, this would be a great time to go before a Sunday. That'd be perfect. I go to this prayer group um, and I get introduced to um, one of the leaders there. And it was really, really great. And they let me into introduce me to the pastor, Hector. And I just started like going to this church. Um, never seen that girl at the church again. She never came to work for me again. She, she came to like do the application. Angel. Yes. And I needed a new church. And so she told me. And I was like, you know, to this day, you know, I'm, I haven't seen her again, but the wow. Lord blessed me with that encounter. So I go to this new church. This church stands on truth and the love of God, but truth, okay? And the truth is the word of God mm -hmm. and all of the word of God. Mm -hmm. You can't pick out parts of Leviticus you want to follow and part of it you don't. You know all of the word. And so I start going to this church and then I get a part of young adults group. And that's within the same, like, probably like four weeks going to the church. You know, the young adults pastor came up to me. I started to go. They found my social media. Mm. Because I'm in a part of young adults, they want to tag you and stuff. And they saw, and I was like, oh, well, the last church didn't see anything. So I didn't know how to approach this. This was my first time. This is real now, right? And what was your social media? Had your social media revealed that you were female? Testosterone. Oh, yeah, testosterone. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I think I posted like a tea date update or something like, oh, oh. seven years on tea. Or six, uh, no, no, at that time it was like four years on tea, five years on tea or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I posted like a, a, an update like that. Not necessarily comparison. I took a lot of those photos down mm -hmm. because the last church didn't know. So I was like, okay, God, uh, like I want to be careful. I, I know you have something for me and I know my life is going to be important. I don't know what it is, but I shouldn't have a lot of crazy things on there. But she saw posts and they called me into a meeting. And this is when you get confronted. And this is when the enemy can either come into your ear and change everything and you get church hurt and you pick up that, that kind of mantle or you pick up the mantle and the one that God hands you, mm -hmm. that real and that truth. Mm -hmm. And they, they came to me and they were So this real. was a defining moment yes, for you. Yes, this was, this was literally pivotal. And what did that yes. conversation sound like? And this is for all of you pastors listening, pastors that are curious about this approach. And youth pastors, right? And youth pastors, you, they sat with me and I said, hey, We've seen your social media, so we know. And I said, the only thing on my social, social media that called me into a meeting with you is that I'm trans. Mm. And they're like, yes. Mm. We just want to tell you, we love you. We are so happy that you are here. But please be open to listening to the Holy Spirit. Wow. Those are great words. And in that moment, I'm first thinking, oh my gosh, did they really just call me out because of my social media? Then I had to stop and literally in the moment, because they're right there. And this is, this is where the pivotal moment happens. We're all silent. Jess, what's about to come out of your mouth? Mm. Are you about to be angry because they're telling you what truth is and that they're acknowledging what, who you are? Mm. Or are you going to get defensive and be mad that they're telling you, we know? Mm -hmm. And so do you feel like in that moment, that was the Holy Spirit, all the training, all the forgiveness that yes, had happened. You can literally. just kind of see it 
Yes. And it was in that moment of surrender, mm-hmm. right? So yes. how, how, like, what, was, what yes. was that feeling? What was going on in your mind? I was like, wow, God, this... Of course you would call. If we pray, God change me, God change my heart, God edify me, why would we not expect something to happen and move? So when I got confronted, it's like, well, you've been praying. Mm. You've been asking that God show you truth. You've been asking that God reveal himself to you. You've been asking that God take you to the next level. When they had this conversation with me and I'm like, okay, Mm. I will remain open to the Holy Spirit. They're like, whatever that looks like for you. We are here for you. We love you. We're not asking you to do anything different. We're just asking you that you stay open to the Holy Spirit. I left mad and frustrated at first. And then I took a deep breath and was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. They didn't ask you, why did you change? They didn't tell you to go change. And I'm sitting in my car still outside of the church. They just asked you to stay open to the Holy Spirit. And it was all the way up into that moment. How are you going to respond? Mm. Truth is truth. If you want to follow truth, you're going to get confronted at one point or another. Mm. Because God will meet you where you're at. But God also wants to elevate you. He wants to take us from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean he wants you to stay where you're at. He doesn't give you certain things around you just so you can be comfortable. Mm -hmm. He wants you to be shaped and edified. Them sitting with me, being real with me, not asking me to change, not even confronting me. They just talk to me. We're aware of it. Certain things we can't, you know, got to be aware of social media. Mm -hmm. You know, people will follow you at the church and we're just trying to be on the same page. And I appreciate that. From that moment on, we've we've had open communication. We've discussed any difficulties I've had, any conversations that we've had with the body of Christ. They've come to me when any when people in the church get curious before um, when I started to uh, make some adjustments, because only the team knew Mm -hmm. the core team knew that I was walking this out. So, you know, all the pastors knew, their wives knew. I knew core people knew I was walking this out with God, Mm -hmm. going at my pace, letting me do this walk. Mm -hmm. They respected me. Mm -hmm. They also prayed for me that truth would come to me. They didn't say, oh, I pray that you change and that God hits you right now with it. No, we love you because it's a process. Just because mine was a physical change. It's just as if someone was just starting to stop alcohol, stop start, uh, stop smoking weed or just any of those adjustments. Mm-hmm. You still need someone to walk mm-hmm. with you, still an accountability partner. Mm-hmm. And that's what the church has been to me. And then there became a day when you stood on stage at that church oh, and you shared with yeah. the entire congregation who you were and what you were about. So oh what, gosh. how did that, why did that happen that way? Oh yes, because we had been strategic from the first conversation. We have been, I have been honest with them. If you are really in this process and you, God is moving in any kind of way, shape or form with wanting you to adjust anything, you need foundation. Mm -hmm. He has set me up with such a foundation of uh, honesty and transparency with the church that I've been able to tell them where I'm at. I would do updates with them, the young adults pastor and the head pastor. And I would say, oh my gosh, this is what God is showing me. He's telling me that I'm beautiful and he's showing me in this kind of way. And I'm not distracted. And I would update them, update them, update them. And then you were, you're dressing as a man. You were yes. still going by Aiden. Yes, and yes. And you wanted your entire congregation to know you for who you were. Yes. So talk through yes. that. Yes. So I'm doing this though, as, as God's edifying me and I'm getting updated and giving them updates. I personally, in my day-to-day life, was starting to make adjustments already. Sunday, I was still dressed like a man. So my day-to-day, though, started to adjust a little bit more non-binary, which means like more fluid clothes, right? So here comes the time where I'm like, you know what? I cannot keep living a double life. Sundays, I can't be aided. And during the week, the Lord is showing me how I'm adjusting to Jessica. Mm -hmm. Like I cannot live two different lives. And so as the time is coming, December of 2022, I now had celebrated one year off of testosterone, right? And so I'm with the Lord and I'm like, I felt the Lord in October right before that was, you're going to come out as Jessica. No way, God. There's no way. I have literally been presenting as a man on Sundays. How am I just supposed to? Because during the week, me and him have been doing this, and I haven't told the church yet. So they don't know. And I did not want them to think, unfortunately, what you had thought, right? That I was a man dressing like a woman when they didn't know my foundation. I did not want the church to hate me. I didn't want the church to get mad or you know, freak out. So I talked to Hector. Here I am, and I'm ready to align. But the only way I can align is if I can come out at one time. 
I don't want to come out one by one, every conversation, try to readjust and people talk behind my back. I want to be the one to give the narrative Mm -hmm. as to what God has done for me Mm -hmm. and in my life. So how did you emotionally and mentally prepare for that moment? Prayed, (laughs) prayed, (laughs) prayed, 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 prayed. I just prayed to the Lord. You know what? You, I know he had been working. I just was personally having the fight because Sundays I was presenting. Sundays I felt like I was faking it. And not that Isn't the that service. Isn't so crazy though? Yeah. Like, I mean, like you were trying to be everything that God wanted you to be through the week. And yeah. everyone that's listening to this needs to understand that. And then yeah. you came to church yeah. on Sunday and and was feeling like you were being forced to not be who God wanted you to be. Yep. And and so, yeah, talk about that Sunday. Yeah. So the Lord, was, I was just like preparing. I'm like, okay, God, like you want me to do this. You want to literally, God, use this platform. You, you created me. You set me apart. Let's do this. And so I prayed. I prayed to God that he give me the words. And I have a video of how the Lord gave me the instant download of what to say. I edified it a little bit. And that was the speech I gave that has reached over 300,000 people on TikTok and on my social media. Mm. I'm like, wow, God, because you have a purpose. So he used that specific speech to reach so many people. Why? Because it was truth. I got to be able to give a glimpse of my past, a glimpse on the confusion, a glimpse as to why I changed, a glimpse into the hope, Mm -hmm. and finally, a glimpse into the future as to where I'm going Mm -hmm. as a woman and daughter of God, right? right? So preparing for that speech, I'm like, okay, God, we're doing this. And if you, if you find that video on social media and you look back at it, my hair was still short. My voice was adjusting. I still kind of looked a little fluid because I was like, I don't want to be over feminized right now because they don't know. Mm-hmm. But I also don't want to be hyper masculine because I need to be real. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, I just said this. You formerly know me as Aiden. So please have your hearts open for what I'm about to say. And when this goes out, we'll kind of put the link to yeah. your testimony. It is, it powerful. is incredibly yes. powerful. Yes, so, yes. The yeah. Lord moved in that. And then how did the congregation oh. respond? I had, I had been there by this point for a year and a half. By this point, and it was January this year. Like, it's crazy to think about just four wow. months ago. Uh, I, I shared my testimony January 15th. That was when the Lord said, let's go. Mm-hmm. And so when I shared this, Everyone stood up. Everyone was clapping and cheering and crying and crying and crying. Did you there expect was, that? Oh my gosh, no. There was lines of people to hug me. Mm. I'm going to cry because there was so much love. Mm-hmm. There was so much love. Every part of the fear I had, how would they respond? They loved me. Why? Because they knew me. Mm -hmm. Did not matter. Mm -hmm. Did not matter. Mm -hmm. It was as if someone was saying they're finally free from alcohol. Mm -hmm. It was that they're finally free from pornography. They just felt that I was broke. I I had breakthrough. Mm -hmm. They just knew that part. Mm -hmm. They were like, wow. Mm -hmm. I had a part of my speech that I didn't say out loud. But it was at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm going to start going into the girl's bathroom and start dressing like a woman. So please don't be weird. And the Lord had me stop and not say that. You know why? Because they knew it was a real change. Mm -hmm. They see me surrender. Mm -hmm. They watched me cry on Sundays. Mm -hmm. I'm in the front row. I'm a front row goer. (laughs) You are. Just so you know, I'm a two service kind of gal. Okay. I'm in the front row. And so they would see me cry two services. They'd watch me fall out. They saw me lay it down. So when I pointed out that that's what I was doing when I laid it out, they cried Mm -hmm. because they saw me. Mm-hmm. They watched my vulnerability, mm-hmm. but they did not know what I was being vulnerable about. Mm-hmm. But they watched it. Mm-hmm. They loved me throughout it. They did not need to know the depths of what I was going through. Mm-hmm. But did I have family pray for me? Did I have the church body pray for me, lay hands over me, be right there when I had a struggle? Absolutely. They did not know the depth, mm-hmm. but they knew that I was someone in Christ that loved the Lord that needed help. Mm-hmm. And they just loved me through it all. So when I came out, Ever since then, there are so many people at church that know my name that I still have to learn their name. But so many people are like, I'm praying for you. So many people are like, God's going to use you so, like to go places and use that voice. Why? Because truth is truth. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard right now in this day and age to find what the truth is. Mm -hmm. But it's also not that hard because we know the truth is the word of God. Right. And if you stand on the word of God Mm -hmm. and and go to a church that's on the word of God Mm -hmm. that will love you 
And that's all we got to do is just love. Mm-hmm. And I am grateful to go to a church that loved on me through that and still loves on me through this and still is, you know, gracious to me as I make my adjustments, as my hair is getting longer, as I now started wearing makeup. They are complimenting me, loving me, telling me I'm beautiful and reassuring me that God is real and he's doing this in my life, which helps me have a good foundation. Yeah, part of the, our, our connection that Sunday morning was... God's timing in profound mm-hmm. ways for yeah, me as well, yeah. because it was so ironic. Um, the week before we met, we were planning our women's tea event. Yeah. And I remember sitting in our office with our staff mm-hmm. and we were going through the timeline of the day and we had speakers that were going to be speaking at that event. And the whole purpose of the event was uh, on womanhood. Mm -hmm. Right. And the enemy's attack on womanhood Mm -hmm. through all kinds of situations, through abortion, Mm -hmm. through um, sexual abuse, Mm -hmm. through transgenderism, you know, all of these things. And so we were specifically talking about womanhood. When I met with my staff that Saturday or that Tuesday, we all said, there just feels like there's something missing. And none of us knew. Like, it just, it just feels like something's missing. And so here I am that Sunday in front of you, I'm listening to your testimony and the verbiage that you used when we talked was Satan has robbed me of my womanhood yeah. and I am claiming it back. Yeah. And knowing that this tea event was coming <laughs> that Saturday. I looked at you and part of my tears were because I felt like the Holy Spirit in that moment mm. was prompting me to have you be mm. a part of that speaking testimony. Mm. But there's also this due diligence as leaders. You know, um, we have to be really careful who we put on stage. Yeah. And I was like, how do I go to my team and tell them <laughs> in a brief moment what we all just experienced? And and we've got to put Jess on stage and she has to tell her story this Saturday. like. Lord, you have to confirm yeah. um, that, that, that Jess is real, that her testimony is real. Yeah. And then that's when you, after we talked, you sent me your testimony. Yeah. And I got to witness it for myself. Mm. And then we, I just, I just bawled through it. Mm. And then I shared, I shared my brief interaction um, with my husband. And, um, of course my husband was like, be careful, you know, you don't know the history. And I'm like, no, watch her testimony. And then my husband watched it and my husband does not cry, Mm -hmm. but he was in tears. And, um, we both just sat there together and just in this crazy aha moment of God has incredible plans for Jess. And part of my delay in, 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 pulling you into, um, not necessarily the political side of this, but, but even kind of beginning to put you on display is I realized as a woman who's walked with the Lord for a long time, once you throw yourself into the political arena, once you throw yourself in front of people, all of a sudden the enemy can use that. And if you're not grounded and you're not rooted in truth, then it becomes more of this, um, immediate response to culture and what God did and less about the ongoing sanctification process. Mm -hmm. And I'm really protective of you Mm -hmm. and I love what God has done and I love watching you grow in your faith. And, and, but yet there is no doubt the enemy hates your testimony, hates your story, hates how the Lord's going to use it. But Mm -hmm. I just want to say, uh, what the enemy intends for evil, God's going to use for incredible glory. And um, everyone out there listening, just asking them to continue to pray for you. Absolutely. And continue to give you, um, as my prayer has been over the last eight years, Lord, open up doors of opportunity mm. that no man can close um, and and for his glory alone. So I just want you to know that. And what mm. what also was really beautiful about as I sat in my car after you and I met and I cried asking for forgiveness for the way that I immediately judged you, um, for those in the listening audience, your name is, and you prefer to go by Jessica or Jess 
Rose. Yeah. And so when I knew your name and you shared that with me, I immediately drove from the church uh, to Home Depot and got a rose Mm. bush that I planted outside my kitchen window. And every single day, especially now in the summer, (laughs) that that rose is growing. I think of you and I pray for you. So I also just want to encourage anyone out there listening, go get a rose at Home Depot or Lowe's, plant it. And when you plant it, uh, not just pray for you, Jess, but pray that God would do a transforming work in this next generation through your testimony. Mm. Um, And so, um, okay, so as we wrap it up, because I don't think we intended for it to go this long, but... (laughs) Here we are. I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> um, you mm. know, what would you say to pastors and what would you say to youth pastors who have people like you who are walking through their doors? Yeah. So if there's anyone in any age coming to you or to your church, they don't want to come to you to change. I didn't go to church to change. Mm. I went to church for the Lord. As much as you, youth pastors and pastors are important, people aren't coming to church for you. As much as you're cool and you're great and you have your great personality. That's not why they should be going to church. They're chasing the Lord. They're hungry for something. They're trying to figure out something. They are missing something. You're a missing piece in their life and you can be a messenger, but they're not coming for you. They're coming for the Lord. So your job is what God told you, which is to love, right? And people, what is that practical? If I come to you and I'm asking you for advice in dating and I'm full on in this as a man, okay, here I hear where you're at. Consider this. What is the Lord doing in this time? And give advice based on that. Where they're at is very real. What they need is real advice. But they also need to be alone with the Lord. So if they're asking for dating advice or things of that, of course, you don't want to affirm anything. So you're not trying to sit here and like, I'm wholeheartedly here for you for that. I'm here to support you. I'm here to pray for you and what you need. But you need to come at an approach that they're not here for you. They're here to come to the Lord. They're not here to change. Mm -hmm. Like I went to the Lord and in all the first year and a half, I wasn't trying to go back to being a girl. I wasn't even trying to think about that. But I was trying to get closer to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So lead them closer to the Lord. Still give scripture. Don't sit here and say, oh, you should change or you need it. They will. Mm -hmm. But it's not your job to change them. God will change them. And he will literally do it in his timing. He literally did it in his timing. Why? Because he knew I couldn't handle it abruptly. Mm -hmm. I could handle certain things like, yes, we're we're changed. Repentance is real in this. And it was an immediate awakening. Mm -hmm. But there are also certain things that had to just be worked out. Mm-hmm. You have to come to your own realization why there's a, there's humanism in it a little mm-hmm. bit, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's to love them where they're at. And the practical part is be there, mm-hmm. support, pray for them, but don't sit here and in their face like, ah, you really shouldn't be doing that, Jimmy. You know you shouldn't be with her. They don't need to hear that. Why? Because then that's going to have them turn, turn away and not want to talk to anyone. Why? Because again, that's the humanism mm-hmm. in it. So being real with them, being honest with them, listening to them but literally still providing scripture, truth, and love to them in a literal way, Mm -hmm. in a literal slow down. Don't give your immediate opinion because they don't need your opinion. They just need you to be a messenger from God. God, you pray before those conversations. If you know you have to meet with someone in that community, Lord, give me the words to say that reach them where they're at. What were some of the most profound if you even if you remember like scriptures that were given to you so the the most important one was of course Romans 12 uh, 12 2 right don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and there is so much weight to that but that was the scripture like if like I thought of it when I went to my note that was the scripture why because I love change and renewing of your mind which is each thought is different which means I have to stop what I'm doing change the thought and keep going. And as God was renewing my mind, it was the literal sanctification mm-hmm. daily. Stop thinking about the gender, just the love, mm-hmm. just the forgive, just the lessons that God has. Mm-hmm. So he renewed my mind in the other areas that allowed me to heal and look at the gender. But it's not until those other areas of are being renewed forgiveness and again, love and kindness and, and reaching those healing points that you need to address Because you're not going to get to the root unless you go through all of those things. And when you come to scripture that you don't like, right? (laughs) Um, Like how, 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 how did that rub against you? And, and what did you do with the scriptures that were given to you? And you can share other scriptures. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
when when it was something that was truth that I didn't I, I couldn't I couldn't chew on by myself, I had to continuously pray. I had to sit with worship. God, what are you really trying to say in this? Because at the end of the day, the scripture is for it, it is simple at, at the same time to make it applicable. There's not anything that God is telling you to do that you can't walk out. Why? Because all things are possible. And I had to sit with those words. Mm. Unfortunately, with society right now, we create our own definitions. All, ah, that means sometimes, no. <laughs> the Bible says all thing. And I ha- so at, at the same time of my mind being renewed, I had to understand his words are concrete. Mm. We have right now, I'm looking at 2023, we have our own definitions, our own words, and we, we think that I love you means this, this, and that. Mm-hmm. That's not what he said. He said, I will provide all things. He will love you through all things. He will be right there. And I had to understand he meant those things because that was what he said. That is, the, those words is the literal meaning. My brain thinks a little bit different. So when I read it, it's like, okay. If you provide all things, this is on you. And then he would. Mm-hmm. I have a journal, which later you'll see my book when, um, when it's out published with all my thoughts and how God has provided all these little miracles, even in tough scripture. I can't even think of one right now that I didn't like other than the Leviticus section that everybody, you know, chews on. I think it's Leviticus 17 when he goes into like all of the sin. But at the end of the day, even if you sit on that, it's sex. That's a whole other subject that he protected us from. Mm-hmm. That's a whole other category that he had safe. Why? Because he had a purpose for that. So at the end of the day, what didn't I like? Mm-hmm. What could I not chew on that God was asking me to? Okay. Well, one thing that's on my mind right now is just what does, <clears throat> what does your walk look like with the Lord on a daily basis specifically? Oh, oh my gosh. So I'm actually fasting music right now. So I'm on a 30-day fast. Because I was waking up, putting on worship music, and allowing the worship music to usher in the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, that's just how it goes. You need to usher in that Holy Spirit with yourself in prayer time and in the truth, the Word. The music is great. The worship is hype. So I'm in a season right now that is just me and the Lord. So I'm reading the Bible, and I'm listening to the Bible on the Bible app. So I wake up, and I'm literally listening to the Bible. I'm hanging out at home. Um... And what, then I work part time. What scripture are you in right now? Oh my God. I'm in, so I'm in Genesis. Okay. I'm, I'm breaking down the beginning mm. because he created and it was good. And so I'm just looking at the truth and the life of the original part, right? If I, I, I'm, I'm personally in a season, he's the same God, right? So yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm in a season of learning what did he do yesterday? Mm. So if he's the same God, he's going to do it again. <laughs> So I'm Amen. looking at what the beginning was. Right. I'm, I'm trying to go down. And so I'm personally in scripture. Um, and I actually just had my own personal revelation, if you don't mind me sharing this update, because this would summarize almost all of it. I was reading in Genesis 33, 11. Um, this is when, um, so Jacob had his son, right? Um, and essentially, um, Jacob was being blessed and he was splitting from Esau. So um, he's now... He's caught up. They're already taken care of. They, they've now caught up after all the years. And so now he's split from Esau. He's going to go where um, God's telling him to, God's so telling him to go. So this is after Jacob re- yes. and Esau's relationship was yeah. restored. Yes, yes. So then and they yeah, split, right? Yes, right? So Jacob got this. And this is what he said. He said, uh, please take this gift I have bought you, for God has been very gracious to me. I have more than enough. <sighs> When I was reading that, the Lord instantly, God has been gracious to Jessica Rose. Mm. And I started crying, Mm. crying, crying. Why? Because the narrative is Jessica was lost for six years and Jessica is continuing her life. Mm. It had been so much. I was a man. I was a man. I was a man going back to being a woman. I was a woman who was lost. Mm. That's home. Mm. That is home. And I've, and I got that the other day, last week, and the Lord on Tuesday, last Tuesday. And since then, the Lord has instantly downloaded in me the 
precious life he had given me and showed me. Like, I've always been Jessica. Mm -hmm. I currently go by Jess to everyone, and I will still go by it, but I'm Jessica. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer. When I started, I came out as Jess. I was trying to play it safe. I was trying to play it comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I'm Jessica. I am a daughter of a king. And he showed me. He has been so gracious to me and has provided Mm -hmm. all of it in the confusion, in the whole testimony I told you. He loved me through all of that. He wanted me broken, lost, and when I was suicidal. Contemplating my life, he said, daughters, please, you are here still. And you didn't just contemplate suicide one time. No. You contemplated suicide multiple times and attempted suicide, right? And yeah. part of your reason for, for doing that was you said um, you just couldn't see a way out, yeah. right? And yeah. so... And yet God provided a way out. That's what he does. When when the scripture, he's a provider. Mm -hmm. And those words, those definitive words, we kind of create our own meaning. But he is is definite. Mm -hmm. He is a provider by all means. My financial provide the financial provision, like my food, where I live, where I am, like every Mm -hmm. single thing he has provided. And so when I read that, it was like literally just... From the beginning, if you look at all of it, you just mm-hmm. didn't see. Your eyes weren't open. The scales were there. Yeah, The scales were there. The and it is what it is. wasn't born yet. And, and here I am. Yeah. So in my day-to-day, it is in this reading to have the same kind of breakthrough. Mm-hmm. So I can walk in joy every single day. So as we're wrapping up, Jess, what do you want to yeah, say um, to the young woman or man out there who's confused about who they think they are. Be kind to yourself. You don't want to admit where you're at. You don't want to talk about the things that you've been through. You don't want to be a person who's like, I changed or I was in the LGBT community because of trauma or trauma created that. Because society already says that. Society already says you're this way because of this. So we have this pride that's, no, I'm not. Honey, yeah, we are. Mm. The reality is we got hurt. The reality is we went through pain. The reality is we weren't accepted. We were different. And we didn't know how to vocalize that. So for the one that is confused, the one who has questions, wants to change, or doesn't even want to change, come to God as you are. Let him heal the brokenness in you. Once he heals that brokenness, you'll understand the promises he has for you. You'll believe his word he has for you. And when people sow into you, you'll actually receive it instead of just telling them thank you. You'll know that they really pray for you. You'll know that God really does restore. You'll know that God really does provide. But it's not until you're vulnerable with yourself in your own private time, in your own personal prayer closet, then you come. Then you give that to God. And if you need help or you need guidance, ask that God provide somebody for you. God answers prayers, and there are people who want to be there for you. There are organizations that want to help you. I'm a part of a few organizations now that help people who have walked this out, who are changing their lives and wanting to go back to their original creation that God has for them. And there is help. And if you need support personally, you can reach out to me. Um, Again, and if you want some resources, I'm sure Heidi will be able to put those links in. But there are definitely people who want to be there but you have to be vulnerable first with yourself and then with those around you okay i have to tie it with a bow now (laughs) this whole conversation so by god's grace he connected us because of the ministry of alternatives pregnancy center and yes it, it will forever be our mission to um provide free medical care yes Uh, and alternatives to abortion Mm -hmm. um, through the hope of the gospel at our clinic. That's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. But how beautiful is it that God has allowed us to expand our services to include OBGYN um, and bring us women like you? Um, So what would you say to the donors who support this ministry and allow us to, to function as an organization not just serving women in an unplanned pregnancy situation, but even um, allowing this opportunity to happen. What would you say to them? Oh my gosh, thank you so much. 
providing the space for people like myself and people who are different, right? God called us to reach those who are lost. And so the donors and the people who are contributing, you're reaching those who are lost. You may not think in your day-to-day life that I may be reaching someone, but I here to tell you that the Lord is single-handedly using you and all that your donations are, both you know, mentally, physically, financially, how you are donating. People are being reached. This is a real message. The gospel is going out. And people like myself can actually receive care on a practical level away from the spirituality. I'm a real person who really needed to check my body. I'm a real person who needed help. I'm a real person who was lost, needing to figure out things. Now I'm a real person who has hope. I'm a real person who is going to have a family. I'm a real person who's seeking the physical side of it so that I can prepare for what God has for me. And you donors are providing that safe space for people like me to have hope again. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to say thank you. And I appreciate all that you guys are doing for people like us in the communities all over. Jess, it takes a lot of courage to share your message with the world. And so I just want to thank you again for just our time together Mm -hmm. and for, gosh, praise the Lord for his faithfulness in your life Mm. and him redeeming you from your situation and setting you on a new foundation to be Mm. used um, in ways we don't even dream or imagine. God Mm -hmm. bless you, Jess. And uh, thanks to everyone who's listening. Um, right now and we will give resources attaching Mm -hmm. um, your link to your testimony along with how to be a part of the ministry of alternatives thank you so much Mm -hmm.